Welcome to the Just Word Podcast. I'm Pat Bolland. The Just Word Podcast is brought to you by Just Wealth, investing the way it should be just for you. I'm sure you've heard the expression that somebody's forgotten more than most people will ever know. Well, Lou Skeezus is that guy, at least as far as the stock market is concerned. And Lou and I used to work together at BNN, and I learned a lot. Lou went on, and he actually taught at college, and he and I used to do coffee together when he took a break, I guess, from his students. So Lou joins us today. Lou Skeezus, happy capitalism. Great to see you again, my old friend. Hey, Pat, I couldn't be happier. You know, uh, you were mentioning at the uh, top of the show that, you know, we used to work together. And I still think that the work that we did together was the best they've ever done. <laughs> I'm not going to give you an argument on that one, buddy. <laughs> <laughs> Before we get into what's happening in the stock market, so I think it's fascinating. First order of business, congratulations. Madeline did a fabulous job at the Olympics. Yeah, so Madeline, my daughter, has been figure skating since she was three. Uh, she got on the Olympic team as a figure skater and did a great job in the team uh, competition, dragged her team over the line into the uh, finals, and we were very happy for her, having chased her dream and actually capturing it. Well, yeah, it does beg the question, what do you do now? Because she's a Canadian champion. She's been to the Olympics. You know, what's the next step? Well, I mean, uh, she's going to the world championships in March, right? So a couple of weeks down the road, she's going to be in Montpellier in France for the world championship. And from there, there's a Grand Prix that she'll be undertaking a new season, new choreography, uh, new dresses, new blah, blah, you know, just uh, putting it all together for the new season and then going to nationals once again, uh, January of 23. So that's part of the agenda, her ongoing education. Uh, she's uh, at the University of Waterloo taking urban planning and uh, she continues to uh, operate her uh, piano teaching business. And of course, there's time cut out, very little time uh, for her dog. That's my primary responsibility. <laughs> Walk the dog, groom the dog, feed the dog. Uh, what dads do. Uh, okay, I, wanna, I wanted to talk to you in particular. A lot of our audience are, are, are less experienced, we'll say, in what's happening in the stock market. So in your experience, when students walked into your class, where were they lacking in knowledge and, and where did you focus your efforts? Well, my students at the time, uh, Pat, were you know just out of high school, 18, 19, working mm -hmm. their way uh, through their education at uh, Sheridan College. Some went on to uh, study at the university level and so on. So they were younger people with not a lot of uh, moxie, if you will, Pat. And you know the best advice you can give young people like that is accumulate. So eat less than you make, put the rest away, Index funds are a good way to go. Even you know, mutual funds still have a place in uh, the universe for people that are accumulating wealth. So that was my advice. And you know, I my first lecture every semester, Pat, was a standard I called the seven things you need to do to be successful before you graduate. And you know, I mean, it's it's when you look at education. The material that you're presenting is somewhat static, right? Yeah. The stuff in the book is the stuff in the book. It's not going to change, okay? So, you know, there's a lot of things in the world of finance that don't change, like the law of 72, right? Divide your interest rate into 72, and that'll tell you how many years it'll take for the money to double if you're an investor or what you're going to be putting out if you're a, a borrower right? So that's not going to change. That math is standard. Um, but there are things that, you know, outside the classroom that you can learn. And I always advise my students, number one, to find a mentor, someone like yourself, Pat, that can show them the ropes. And I know you've done that in your career when you were working on the street. And even when you were working in broadcasting, when I met you, you were helping a lot of young people uh, craft, manage, you know, artistically put stuff together in a better format. So you're familiar with the concept of helping people and, you know, advising young people to 
find a mentor is the best thing possible. So in the world of investing, I would recommend you as someone to go to. They can come to me. My former students still come to me uh, really? with various comments, right? Um, you know, one, uh, just the other day, uh, Shakur, uh, you know, saying, no, you gave me the best advice possible. Don't overcomplicate things. Keep it simple. Right. So at the beginning, uh, the best thing I can advise, I advise until you learn more is to use a diversified portfolio with either professional management or just static uh, investment in an index ETF for that sort of thing. And, you know, just ride it till you accumulate enough to get serious about it. Yeah. Truth be told, uh, we're sponsored by a robo-advisor. So that'd be another way that you could go. Right. And uh, I'm not familiar with robo-advisor other than you know, it's something that has got algorithms doing what uh, maybe a live person can do. And, you know, that can work as well. You know, as long as you're accumulating, if you're not accumulating and the only thing you're accum accumulating assets and the only thing you're accumulating is debt, I would say the clock is on you. You better start running. <laughs> <laughs> oh, okay. So that's uh, mentoring, uh, the uh, keep it simple. Uh, anything else in those seven? Well, I always said, you know, get a job while you're in college. <laughs> well, you know, get it, you know, either a part time job or a full time job. And in fact, you know, a lot of the kids in the uh, college arena, they have to work, right? Yeah. They have to work to pay the overhead. I had to when I was a kid. Yeah. yeah. And I said, you know, if you could segue your way or find your way into a field that you're studying. So if you're in uh, finance or economics or that sort of thing, and you know you were thinking that that was going to be your career, go and apply to bank branch and try and you know get into their system so that by the time you graduate with your brand new diploma, right, you've got two or three years experience, and they might look at you and say, you know what, we like the cut of your jib. Yeah. Yeah. Good, good advice. Uh, well, I mean, you know, I had to work. I, I, I washed dishes at the College View restaurant and was happy for it, right? Yeah, and I worked in the restaurant business too. And that's where I learned how you serve people. And, I, you know, it's, it's great. Uh, okay, that's, uh, we've got one, two, three, three of the seven. Okay, so the other thing I would say is you want to join your industry association, right? Oh. Every industry has an association, right? right. And um, if you join when you're young, what do you think you're going to, who do you think you're going to be meeting at the industry meetings? The movers and the shakers, the builders of the industry, right? right. I mean, you don't see the slackers hanging out at the industry association. It's the people with a thousand things to do, but they're doing this for the future of the industry. And those people, you know, theoretically could become mentors if they see you, you know, showing up and doing the job that you're supposed to do, right? Yeah, so it plays into both uh, those mentorship and get a job and learn kind of thing. Right, and um, attend industry seminars and symposium, right? Like in the capital markets, as you know, there is a seminar, there is a gathering, there is a presentation every hour of every day. Now, that's learning outside the classroom. Yeah. So take advantage of that. Listen to podcasts. Right. Listen to podcasts. That's a good one. And the other thing that you can do as well is you could look at accumulating uh, industry credentials before you graduate. Mm. So, you know, uh, in, in the earlier stages of my career, you could take the Canadian securities course and pass it without having to have an advanced degree or anything like that. Right. Well, when your resume showed up and said, I have the Canadian securities course, right, already passed and the practices handbook, your resume tends to rise to the top of the stack. Why? They don't have to wait for you to get licensed, right? Yeah. You know what, though? That Canadian securities course, and I know people who've taken it over the years, it's gotten harder and harder. When you, you know, we go back a long way and they were happy to teach you the information, but not, you know, test you as hard as they are now. Apparently it's quite difficult. Well, you know, Pat, I don't know because I haven't written it in a long time, but I did no, teach the course once and I said, well, you know, it's it's challenging, but that's what it's supposed to be. I mean, okay. as you know, with any kind of licensing exam, it's not about an open door. It's about narrowing the opening. So, you know, we're keeping the riffraff out, so to speak. Yeah, good point. Good point. 
No. Uh, okay. So then you did the teaching for a few years and, and very successfully. Do you kind of miss what you used to do in the markets? And I, and I know you and I used to talk about small cap, but you had a lot more on the plate than that. Yeah. Uh, you know, Pat, I do and I don't. I mean, you know, when you're dealing with other people's money, uh, there's a lot of tension that goes through the relationship, <laughs> you know, win, lose or draw. I mean, I don't know if you recall, but in my experience, you know, if you made people money, it wasn't really, you didn't get a pat on the back and an attaboy, you lose mm -hmm. the money, they got a lot to say. So yeah. there's a lot of tension that goes with the relationship and you have to be prepared for that. I remember uh, hiring an assistant at one point and, you know, I asked her, you know, I said, uh, it was in the interview process. I said, Catherine, what's a mutual fund? And she started to stutter, you know, that, that I'm, I'm getting ready to lie you know, which is an early tell, of course. And then she just said, honestly, I don't know. And I said, well, that's the best answer you could ever give me, right? Yeah. I can't teach honesty. And obviously you thought better of, you know, stepping over that line, put her on the job. She's still in the business today. Right? So, well, I mean, you know, it's about trust, right? If I yeah. can't trust you, why would I give you my money? Yeah, but, but you run into situations and this, the geopolitics right now and the market correction we're seeing right now, for instance, given the situation in Russia and, uh, and Ukraine, uh, that, that can try a relationship. Well, yeah, but you have no control over those elements. And I think that, you know, when you're looking at investing, the question becomes, are you investing for today, tomorrow, next month, next year, 10 years from now? I mean, if the investment horizon is too short, anything can throw you into a tizzy, right? Whereas if you got a long-term perspective and you're saying, well, when do I need this money? Well, you know, when I used to advise clients, Pat, and they say, well, I want to buy a house in two years. I said, well, we're not going to take on a whole bunch of risk with this money. We could with some of the money, but you know, this is sacred money. You want to buy a house with that? No, yeah. we're not going to, you know, roll the bones on, you know, uh, something that is too high risk for your profile. And that's why you get back to your know your client rules, right? You better know your clients because if you're putting them into inappropriate investments, nothing good's going to happen for you or for them. Yeah. Uh, I do want to focus on this ge geopolitics because I think, and I'd love your feedback on this, I think this might be an opportunity for Canadians uh, in that, and, and I'm not saying getting involved in any, any kind of a war, but from the investment point of view, if you look at what Canada has, we have everything that Russia has and what the rest of the world needs, oil, uh, you know, mining materials, those kinds of things. What are your thoughts on that? Well, you know, Pat, uh, the biggest concern that I have when you're talking about the extraction industries, right, mm -hmm. is yep. that a lot of them have been essentially legislated out of business. You can't build a pipeline. You can't uh, develop a mine. I mean, it's a headache. Now, you know, what you're saying about geopolitics, oh yeah, uh, tight supply, whatever's coming out of the existing infrastructure has got greater value. So there is an appreciation in terms of uh, the basic commodities you've been talking about, oil, gold, you saw it yesterday of like 29 bucks or something, right? Yeah. People are concerned and supply is not expanding. It's being contracted. So even though we can't move as much volume as we'd like in Canada, whether it's minerals, oil, forestry, or what have you, um, the price of the commodities go up and that's going to expand the value of the stocks of companies uh, that actually do that kind of work. The other component in the stock market that's been interesting in the last two or three years has been the uh, high tech space technology. And, and I'm talking about, you know, the Facebooks or whatever they call it now, uh, or the Teslas or those kinds of things. There was a, there was a real push towards innovation and the opportunities that way, but those things can and have shown to come back and bite you occasionally, don't they? Well, it depends on which it is, right? Is it a fad like Peloton, which was a great, you know, stationary bike with lessons and screens and all that stuff. Yeah. They were a, a, a pandemic darling and they fell out of bed as people realized that, you know, maybe I will get out of my house someday, right? <laughs> you know, maybe I will take a walk in a cappuccino with Pat again, right? Depending on health and all that sort of stuff. When you're looking at the tech space, you know, it's a much like a, an emerging market in that it's a high valuation, it's got a speculative component. And if you don't show up with the do re mi every quarter, you're going to get sold off. Yeah. 
Yeah, entirely true. Whereas you've got the old standbys, you know, financial services and banks have been uh, one of the hallmarks of the Canadian stock market for a long time and continue to be so. Well, yeah, I mean, that's, you know, Madeline just turned 18 last yeah. year. So first thing we did was, you know, open a, 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 an unregistered account, open a TSFA, open an RRSP, right? So I said to her, well, what are you thinking? And um, I, I advised, you know, look at the banks, just like you're saying right now. And I said, you know, any bank that you like? And she says, well, I like the Royal Bank. And I said, how come? She said, I like the Lions. <laughs> yeah, I, I truth, said, you know, honest, to, honest to goodness truth. I like the Lions too. <laughs> <laughs> so I said to her, I said, listen, these are dividend paying blue chip stocks. Nothing has really disrupted the moat around their business. And uh, I said, that's as good a call as I've seen. Now, later, uh, she came and she says, I want to buy some weed. And I say, hold on, hold the phone. <laughs> what do you mean? Oh, I want to buy some pot stocks and weed, you know, uh, canopy growth. And I said, well, what's your investment thesis? She said, I think it's going to be legalized in the States. I said, how much are you willing to commit to that? She said, 500 bucks. And I said, well, that's not a, a big bag of dough. You know, you could afford to pay some tuition if it goes wrong. And it did go wrong, right? The right. thesis that the U.S. was going to legalize pot over you know, the course of the Biden administration, that's on the back burner right now. And uh, you know, the stock, I think she bought it at 28. Uh, it's at $8 today. Not wow. a big hit, right, overall. You know, she did make money on dividends and growth in her Royal Bank, right? But you know, the investment thesis was incorrect. Yeah, but lesson learned, right? Yeah, I mean, thus endeth the lesson. Now, I don't want her to be afraid not to buy stuff, Right. In fact, we're coming up to the decision what to do with her uh, 2022 TSFA and so on. So we'll have a more uh, nuanced discussion, if you will. As yeah, we but, but stick with the tried and true for the majority and then maybe have some play money on the side, which is how you would describe that, I would think. Well, yes, yeah, speculative, right? Speculative. Oh, the U.S. Another is going. Of to, U, yeah, the U.S. is going to legalize pot. When, who, why, why? You know, it's like it's hard to say, really. So you know that was a win and a loss, but the win carried the loss, so we're okay for her. Well, then we're running uh, short on time. Any last thoughts? And and before you do go, I want to make sure we do have coffee in the future. Yeah, of course, Pat. Just, you know, now that we're allowed to go out. Yeah, exactly. You know, we haven't been chained to the basement any longer. Um, the last thing I would say to your listeners, Pat, is, you know, take the time to identify if you're an investor, a speculator, or a gambler. Okay. Right. So an investor will look for dividends, growth, steady uh, history of paying dividends. Um, a speculator is going to run after boom and bust resources right? May or may not work out a pot play, maybe. And a gambler is just, you know, betting on a lawsuit. Good luck with that. Yeah. Just identify right. your or investment. Bitcoin problem. or some other thing. Yeah. <laughs> Lou, always a pleasure talking to you. Pat, loving it. We'll do it again. And we'll have that coffee. Happy capitalism. <laughs> Thanks. Lou's Jesus. <laughs>